Hello, Jeff Zwerink, and welcome to Science Faith Connection, the segment of our show where we explore the latest scientific discoveries and see how they relate to the truth of the Christian faith. Today I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Fuzz Rana, and we are going to explore what science has to say about the origin of life. Fuzz, good to have you here. Jeff, thanks. So I just, uh, you know, I mean, origin of life, that's one of these fascinating scientific questions. Mm -hmm. A lot of research done over many decades. Uh, just kind of, if you could take a couple of minutes and summarize, what is Reasons to Believe's position on the origin of life? Yeah, well, I mean, ultimately we would take the view that God created the very first life forms on earth. So when we talk about the origin of life, we're referring specifically to the origin of the very first cells on earth. So we would see that as the, the, the direct work of a creator. And if that's the case, then in our creation model, we make a number of predictions. You know, for example, that uh, the very first cells would likely appear suddenly on Earth. If it's a creation event, you would expect the cells to suddenly appear, you know, in the fossil record or evidence for the cells appear, appear you know, in the geological column in the geochemical record. You know, also, uh, we would expect the very first cells to be inherently complex and then also show evidence for design. And then in our creation model, we think that Genesis 1-2 is a passage that's making uh, a reference to the appearance of the very first cells on Earth. And in the book Origins of Life, we kind of unpack the reasoning mm -hmm. behind that. Well, if that's the case, then Genesis 1-2 gives us a depiction of the early earth, and that should be the setting in which life would originate. Mm. And so we can then compare the conditions of the earth when life appeared with what we see in scripture as a way to, to assess our model scientifically. So, you know, you wrote Origins of Life, I think back in 2004, I kind of had a follow-up book, uh, uh, Creating Life in the Lab, where you kind of flesh out some things in a little bit different. Uh, you know, it's been a decade or right. more since those books have come out. What are some of the significant developments that have come about since then? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, in, in Origins of Life, we kind of present our uh, creation model for the origin of life and show that the evidence seems to align with what our model predicts. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the book is really critiquing different chemical evolutionary scenarios for the origin of life, showing that none of them work. Mm -hmm. And then creating life in the lab uh, picks up on that theme, uh, but also uh, goes one step further and makes the case that the work that people have done in synthetic biology where they're trying to create protocells or uh, the, the work that people have done in prebiotic chemistry where they try to go in the lab and replicate the different steps they think that led to the origin of life, all that work essentially demonstrates the necessary role of intelligent agency to bring about the transformation of chemicals into, you know, what we would call protocellular type entities. So, so you've got this scenario where in looking at origin of life, we can actually do some of the things that lead to the origin of life. So it's not like we've just got this kind of, it's like miraculous, there's no way to explain right. it type thing. So we can get a handle on what's going on, but you argue that still points towards a creator. Why so? Well, well because uh, in, in effect, you have to have um, uh, intelligent agency as being a critical aspect of, of that process. So you have uh, uh, reactions that you would execute in the mm -hmm. laboratory or different types of chemical or physical processes that are done under highly controlled conditions, executed by highly skilled researchers following very elaborate strategies. You know, that, that, that the laboratory setting uh, is, it, it produces results only because the researchers have, in effect, introduced <laughs> their activity into the experimental design, uh, making intelligent agency a critical component of that process. So, so one of the early experiments that goes on this Yuri Miller type experiment, you know, you put a bunch of gases, liquids in a jar, shoot sparks in it, you get amino acids out, kind of points to mm -hmm. things just happening naturalistically. Is this sort of intervention going on there? Or, I mean, because that seems pretty much just kind of let's replicate the early earth and let it go. Yeah, well, but the thing is, in, in a sense, the early Earth isn't, you know, replicated in that experiment in the sense that you have these highly controlled conditions in order to get 
that reaction to work, you have to very carefully adjust the concentrations of ammonia mm. and methane and hydrogen, you know, in the headspace. You have to, you know, make sure oxygen is excluded. You know, so in, in other words, you're creating this highly artificial, highly contrived atmospheric conditions. And and by the way, most people today don't think the Miller-Urey experiment was relevant because the, the gaseous conditions that he employed uh, isn't what we now know mm. to be the gaseous conditions on the early Earth. But the, the point there is that it only works because it's a highly contrived, very carefully controlled system where everything has been rigged, if you will, from the onset to make uh, that experiment work or to have for that experiment to have any chance of working. So the idea that uh, scientists just go, you know, dump some alcohol, dump some ammonia, put it all in, throw sparks in, and you get stuff out, that's really not an accurate picture of what's going no, on. No, not at all. And in fact, you know, one of the most intriguing developments in original life research is the recognition of what's called unwarranted researcher involvement. And so this was really the concept that we were bringing across in the book, Creating Life in the Lab in, in 2011. Mm -hmm. And in 2018, a, a German original life researcher published a, a perspectives piece where he essentially brought up the same points we brought up in Creating Life in the Lab, that many of the experiments done in prebiotic chemistry are highly contrived experiments where they, the, they are rigged in such a way to ensure the success of the experiment, but they don't really translate to the conditions of the early earth. They, they lack what uh, researchers would call geochemical relevance. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so Reichert refers to this as the hand of God dilemma, that, that we are in effect stepping in and are assuming the, the, the role of an intelligent agent that is in a sense uh, ensuring the successful outcome of the experiments. And on the early earth, you don't have that level of control, that level of intervention. And so what we do in the lab very well may not have any relevance to uh, what actually uh, uh, could have transpired under the conditions of the early Earth. So, uh, you know, it's, it seems to make sense that these reactions only kind of arise in very specific situations or specific conditions. You got the early Earth there. I mean, there's a lot of surface area, a lot of water, a fair bit of time. Wouldn't these things just kind of wouldn't you expect it to happen somewhere on the early Earth, or, or is it more... Well, it's not to say that the chemical reactions that had been discovered in the lab would never occur on the early Earth. It's just that they would never be productive. Okay. Right, that, that, that you know, for example, many of the experiments that are done are done under what I would call chemically pristine conditions, where you have the, the two reactants or the three reactants that you're interested in studying... Mm -hmm. You know, you're excluding every other uh, chemical species that likely would have been present on the early Earth, but you're excluding mm. it from the experimental design. But if you actually included those chemical materials, the likelihood of, of that chemistry actually taking place in a productive way is, is highly unlikely. And because these other materials would basically interfere with the, the chemistry, would create side reactions or consume the reactants or in, in things like that, or in turn react with the product as soon as it's formed. So the, you, you create these controlled, chemically pristine conditions in the lab, the experiment works, but you know, even though the earth, surface of the earth is vast and there's a lot of environments, the likelihood of this being productive and meaningful for chemical evolution you know, would be extremely unlikely. Well, thanks, Fuzz. I really appreciate your comments. You know, the origin of life is one of those topics where in Scripture we see God being the author of all life. And, you know, as Fuzz referred to in Genesis 1-2, we see intimations of that in the Spirit hovering over the surface of the water. And what's remarkable is as we go out and study and look at creation and try and understand how life started here on earth, we find that the biblical description matches and we really do see evidence that without a mind behind it, it's not going to happen. You know, I would encourage you to go to reasons.org. Fuzz has written a great article on this topic called Prebiotic Chemistry and the Hand of God. Go check out that article so that you can understand how researcher intervention is so important and how that points to God being the creator of life here on earth.